and communicating greetings to all our elders and everyone that are here tonight in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we bless you, God. We honor you and we exalt you because you are worthy. There is none like you, Lord Jesus, none to be compared to you. You are sovereign. Amen. Lord God Almighty, you are our life and light. Hallelujah. You are the bread that we breathe, Lord Jesus Christ, and we exalt your precious name. Father Amen. God of Nazareth, Lord God Almighty, as we come before you one more night, Lord Jesus, to gather to peace. Hallelujah. From you, God, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will have your way with us tonight, God. We pray that you will move among us, Lord Jesus, like you have never done before, God Almighty. Hallelujah. There are some of us that are hungry, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and we're asking for you to fill us tonight. Father God, we present this platform before you, God, that you will anoint it with your blood and your fire. We present, Lord Jesus Christ, your speaker, Lord God Almighty, that will speak into our spirits tonight. We pray that you will cover her under the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, that you will anoint her tongue and her thoughts. We cancel this traction, Lord God, and anything that will try, Lord God, to disrupt you. Oh God, your service. We cancel the operations of hell. We close the portals, the preachers, and the ancient And we decree and we declare. God, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against us, Father, because some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is a strong tower, and the righteous run it in and are saved. Bless the moderator, God. Bless everyone that are here tonight in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. 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 Thank you, woman of God. We'll read for our scripture lesson tonight from the book of Genesis chapter 15. And I'll just read while you listen. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer, Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine here. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine here, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels. Sorry, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine here. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if they'll be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And, the Lord, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and lo and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Ken. 
and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphaites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Praise the name of God. Praise God. We just bless God tonight for his word. We thank God that he is a covenant keeping God. And whatever God has covenanted, glory to God, that will he do. God bless you tonight, saints of God. And as I said, I bring greetings to everyone on the platform in their respective places, their respective positions. Very glad we are to see you tonight. And we believe that your cups are up and it's empty and it's ready to be filled. And we are trusting God for another great night tonight of serving of the word of God. God bless you. At this time, we just go straight to our Bible teacher. And I'll just use the opportunity to present no other than our own evangelist, Karen Mitchell. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you in the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. God bless you, Elder Hill. One of my favorite persons around town, and you know that too. <laughs> Hallelujah. We bless oh, God. God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I greet Elder Sharp. Daddy Sharp, the Lord God bless you. Greetings to Elder Marks, Elder Collins, Evangelist Hines, Evangelist Coda. Thank you so much for praying for me. I greet all God's wonderful people that are on, all the ministers in your respective places. I may not know everyone. I see Missionary De Leon's name on. I want to greet you in Jesus' precious name. You know, there are a few persons from the Kingdom Connect Secret Place of the Most High um, platform that we want to greet tonight. I want to greet, again, Evangelist Ayn. I want to greet uh, Brother Yuan Se. Sister Tiana, Brother Theodore Smith, the Lord God bless you, Sister um, Sandra Maga, uh, Sister Veneda, the Lord God bless you, Sister Chantal, God bless you, Sister Narjali, God bless you. And if there is anyone that I am leaving out, please forgive me. I did not mean to leave you out at all. But I greet you all in Jesus' name. God bless you, Sir Hugh. God bless you, Sir, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So there's a scripture that I want to begin with before I go ahead and start tonight's teaching. And I'm asking you to pray for me as I am presenting, please. I don't take for granted that the Lord has chosen me to do this. I don't believe that Elder Sharp um, is a man that operates himself. I know that he does so by the spirit of the living God. And so I don't take it for granted at all. And I just want to avail myself unto the Lord. And so the scripture reading for tonight is coming to us from Galatians chapter 5, from verse 12 to 21. It says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is a free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. That as sin hath reigned unto death, 
even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here in the portion of God's holy words, and we will say thanks be unto God. Hallelujah. So quick little testimony before I go into the teaching tonight. When Elder Sharp reached out to me about teaching, I, I confirmed that I had something that I could present on because I was thinking of a totally different topic. But then as a flyer was being prepared, I recognized that the topic kept on coming back to breaking generational curses. It just kept on coming back there. Even the very images for the flyer just kept on coming back to generational curse. And I was really torn between the two uh, lessons because I did have information on general, um, generational curses, but it had not gone on PowerPoint. And so I wanted to make it a little bit easier by doing the other uh, topic, but the Lord would not have that. And can I tell you, Elder Sharp, the notes that I had before is completely gone. I cannot find them. And so I had to go back into the secret closet and start all over again and come back anew at scratch. So I give God thanks for, you know, where he led me as the spirit of the Lord gave me instructions in my prayer time and I jotted it down in my notes. That's what I did. And so I pray tonight that it will bless you as it did bless me because it did speak to me today as I was doing it. And so I'm going to ask Evangelist Coda to, you know, greet everyone. And then I'm going to begin. I greet you all again in the mighty name of Jesus. I greet Daddy Sharp. I greet Elder Collins, Elder Marx, Elder Ill, and everyone, because I can't see everyone that are on here. I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. I greet you, my sister and partner in spiritual crime. I love you all in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God be praised. I just want to take a quick minute to just pray. Hallelujah. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I subdue principalities and powers right now, God. Every craft to work of hell, Lord God, that would want to come against this teaching, we bind it in the name of Jesus. Algorithmic uh, programmings, Lord Jesus, we pray that angels will disable them right now and that this message, Lord God, will reach nations, lands, countries, races, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God Almighty, I pray, Lord God, that the spirit of slumber and sleep will be bound, Lord God, and that you'll Speak to people's appetite like you did my own today, Lord Jesus. Lord God Almighty, bring us into the realms and dimensions, Lord Jesus, of truth as this word goes forward in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we say amen and amen. Glory be unto amen, God. Amen, 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 amen. So we want to look amen. at what are curses first and foremost, because you talk about generational curse. What are curses? Curses, according to the dictionary online, is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. Again, it is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power, and that power is invoked to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. A curse, um, according to itimonline.com, um, is a verb that means to wish evil to a person or to excommunicate them. So the original meaning, that's what the etymology of the word is, on that website is saying that it is a verb, which means it's an action word. It requires you doing something to have that desire of evil fall upon someone or to excommunicate them. All right. Theologically, however, the Hebrew word for curse is aror. It means to remove the presence of God. So it is not you speaking ill or evil, but this act then, when you do that or you have this desire, causes the individual to be restricted, to be bounded, and to be limited 
to their own imaginations and it demotes their position of authority. Because if you remove God, you remove the, the limitlessness the impossibility becoming a possibility and the promotion that cometh only from God, right? Therefore, theologically, according to the Hebrew word, because we are reading from the Old Testament about uh, generational curses and its beginnings, therefore to curse, to curse someone is to demand that God removes his protective covering, right? And this is normally done by a superior, by somebody that is in authority. Let's see if I can pull this down. A curse can only be passed on by a superior or a person of authority, right? So you have judges that lays curse or judgment on person sentences, right? Uh, you have witches that go into certain realms and they're able to do that on the evil side, the dark side, but then on the side of light, you have prophets, you have priests that are able to do that, men and women of God, right? They operate in a superior, at a superior level with authority. Now, the first of this that we see is God laying down judgment to the serpent, to Eve, and then to Adam. But the way that God does curses or judgments is different from how man does it because if it was man man would have attacked adam first then eve then the maybe they wouldn't even speak to the serpent but god spoke to the base and then to the head of the authority so according to genesis 3 14 to 24 this is what god does after he asks man if he has eaten from the fruit of the forbidden um, tree and he uh confirms then god begins to deal with the serpent who is at the bottom of the chain the instigator the very one that did the beguiling he then moves to the woman who was created after the man and then he deals with the man who initially got the charge knew what the tree of good and evil was and actively ate knowing that that fruit was what he was eating and what he was not supposed to eat the next of a persons that we see ending down curses is Noah unto Canaan, his grandson, the son of Ham, because he saw his nakedness, he laughed, and it was a disgrace. And so Noah made Canaan a base servant unto other servants. We look at God through angels laying down curse on land, Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, 12 to 13. We see God laying down curses through prophets over Israel and Judah, and even today through um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, etc. And we see Elisha, a prophet of God, who laid a curse on his servant Gehazi, 2 Kings 5, 25 to 27. So curses can only be passed on by a superior or a person of authority. So the person must be superior to you or a person of authority. He has some level of authority. There's a gate. There's a door through which he is able to operate. Otherwise, that curse is ineffective, right? We want to go back again what it really means. This act then causes the individual to be restricted. You can only restrict a person if you have the authority or the superiority to do so. It's, it binds them and it limits them, causing them to act out of their own imagination and demoting them from their place or position of authority, All right? Now, this is how a curse moves from curse to generational curse. And we're laying this because you need to know what it is that you're breaking before you break it. See, oftentimes we want to use the weapons of our warfare and we don't know what warfare we are in, what we are coming against. And so I pray that you will pay attention to these things and take note of them so that you will know what it is that you truly need to break. Now, how then does an utterance of punishment spoken against one affects a generation? Because this would be the individual that the curse is laid against. So how does it affect the other pieces that stands in line behind it? Genesis 1, God created systems and placed things necessary in them to facilitate the needs of man. 
for generations. In other words, generations there stands for time and it stands for descendants or offsprings, right? So you have the geosphere. That would be something that falls in line behind man. That's the spherical concentric um, regions of matter that make up the earth and its atmosphere. So you see the outward part, the space part, right? You have the cryosphere. That's the frozen water part of the earth system, like the Antarctica and those places. The hydrosphere, that's all the water of the earth's surface. So the seas and the, the depths above the firmament. The atmosphere, that's the layers of gas that envelops a planet. And the biosphere or ecosphere, all the zone of life on earth that extends to the atmosphere and the deep ocean, so like the tree, mankind, animals, the things that you can find in the water, all of these things stand in back of man, right? So this layout that you see here, this would be Adam and Eve, and behind them would be all the systems of the world that God made to facilitate the, the needs of man. And again, I want you to notice the way that God operates in dealing with curses. He deals directly with the instigator and then he goes to that, the, the one that should be held responsible, right? And so we recognize that these systems were made and it is from the matter of earth that God took the dust, formed man, breathed into the nostrils of man and man became a living soul. So man answers for earth and the systems thereof as well as himself, right? After God made the facilities, he made man. The objective of man was to one, be made in the image and likeness of God. So that image and likeness needs to be kept. Two, have dominion over the creative works of God upon earth. That means he is responsible, he's accountable for God's creative works, the systems. Thirdly, he is called to be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. Fourthly, he is to have dominion over the creative works of God in the sea. And fifthly, he is to till the ground of the garden, dress it and keep it. These are the responsibilities of man. So when a curse is offered upon one, it trickles down at it and it has a domino effect on not only other persons, but the systems of the world as well. This is the, the, the institution that God did. Adam represented God's image. Adam represented God's voice. Out of Adam came, Adam represented the earth. Adam represented authority and dominion. Out of man came woman. Out of woman and man operating as one flesh came mankind. Mankind now has a responsibility and an, an accountability to keep the systems of the earth. And lastly, Eve would have represented conception because she carried the womb. So look at this. Adam now is standing as a type of Christ, a type of God. Because in God lies everything. Out of God, he pulled light. Out of God, he pulled the system of the world. Out of him, he pulled us. And out of him, he continues to pull other creative things. So then Adam stands in a place where he represents Christ. He represents God. We know that out of the side of Christ came the church, just like out of the side of Adam came the woman, right? Now the church, just like the woman, in conjunction or agreement with God, we are supposed to reproduce and bring souls to God. So the replenishing is the replenishing of the kingdom and not so much of the earth, right? So we are reproducing in the kingdom. Daily, there should be an addition, all right? Jumping ahead just a little bit, just to give you an outline of where we are going. But again, notice, Adam represents God's image, God's voice, the earth, authority and dominion. Out of him came the woman. They two together now produce mankind. Mankind as a responsibility to preserve the systems of the world, as the earth as God has instituted it. And Eve represents conception because once that seed is within her, then the incubation stage continues, the germination and all of that until the time for birthing. 
all right? Now, with that said, we see that Adam carried the gene ration of mankind. The gene would have been the DNA, the ration would have been the numerical increase or multiplication. A gene is considered the basic unit of inheritance. Genes are passed from parents to offspring and contain information needed to specify physical and biological traits. Most genes code for specific proteins or segments of proteins which have different functions within the body. Humans have approximately 20,000 protein coding genes. Your genome then is what they call the gene is made of a chemical called DNA for short, right? Let us continue because we want to establish why it is that God made up Adam the way that he made up Adam and why he did not need to replicate Adam and Eve after he made them, but all he needed for them to do was to join together. What then is DNA? DNA is the genetic information inside the cells of the body and those cells lies within the blood that helps make people who they are. It's the instructions for how to make the body like the code to a video game or blueprints for a house. Fine lines. DNA contains four basic building blocks or bases. You have the adenine, that's the A, cytosine, that's the C, guanine, that's the G, and the thymine, that's the T, A, C, G, T. Those are the four basic building blocks or bases for our DNA. The order or sequence of these bases form the instructions in the genome. DNA, DNA then is a two-stranded molecule. No wonder God stress on the fact that two cannot walk together unless they be agreed. So DNA is a two-stranded molecule. We see that it, in order for that two-stranded molecule to come, it requires a man and it requires a woman. A DNA has a unique double helix shape, like a twisted ladder. The bases on one strand of the DNA molecule peer together with complementary bases on the opposite strand of DNA to form the rungs of the DNA ladder. So on one side, it's the female uh, chromosomes, chromosomes, and the next, it's the male, right? The bases always peer together in the same way, A, T, C, with G. Each base pair is joined together by hydrogen, that's natural gas. In Adam was the gene and the DNA needed to replicate, multiply, and continue mankind. So within that sperm lies coding, within that sperm lies proteins, within that sperm lies blood, within that sperm lies everything that would be needed to multiply. However, Adam alone would not form the double helix. So God pulled a rib from his side and formed a woman, his woman. That was the complementary, the opposite strand needed to replenish the earth with man. Together, they represented the chromosome. So, <laughs> oh God, when I was doing this today, I started to think about how oh, wrong mankind's mind have become because we have gotten to a place now where we want to redefine what a woman is and you'll never be able to redefine nothing because if you don't have a womb you're not a woman your the whole thing of it all is that the woman is supposed to be complementary to the man she's the help me so in jewish uh teachings they have it that the woman represents the, the wisdom and that's why she's seen as a crown of the man right but she also represents womb because that rib that was pulled out of the man is no longer there so a man cannot uh, conceive and 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 grow anything within himself it will not germinate there he needs the woman and so the two together the opposite right god not two man not two woman one man one woman that's god's whole genetic setup 
together they represent the chromosomes on the X, X, the Y, the X, Y. All right. Amen. Genesis Amen. 2. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Genesis 2, 21 to 23 says it this way. And the Lord caused, the Lord God caused a deep sleep. And that we know is to represent surgery. That is where man get the whole intent from of putting people under anesthesia. God himself set this up to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had, God had taken from man made a woman and brought her unto the man. Now remember, Adam was fast asleep when God did this under deep anesthesia by the Holy Ghost. But year 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He didn't know that it was a rib that was taken out of his side and that that rib comprised of the womb. But because of the spirit of God, he had that discernment, that word of knowledge, that word of wisdom, and was able to declare it. Because remember, Adam represents the voice of God to the systems and the systems must obey him because he's given dominion over it. Now, Humans have 22 pairs of numbered chromosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes. Each pair contains two chromosomes, one coming from each parent, which means that children inherit half of their chromosomes from their mother and half from their father. So if your mother is freckled, chances are you may be freckled. If your father is short, chances are you may be short. Right, because you take chromosomes from each of your parents. But I want to stick a pin here because there is a genetic agenda from hell where they want to dictate the sex of a child. Did you know that the moment a sperm reaches the egg and it accepts it, the sex of the child is determined. So what you are doing is you're corrupting DNA, you're corrupting chromosomes, you're corrupting that child when you go and try to change the sex because it appeals to you and you want to be Lord, you want to dictate. Lord God, we need to be careful. These things are all generational curses. But moving on. Now, when a curse was pronounced on Adam, the seed carrier, and I want to put, point that out because even if you're dressed like a man, act like a man, talk like a man, you are still not a man. A man requires to have a seed, a woman requires to have a womb. I cannot overemphasize that. Now, when a curse was pronounced on Adam, the man, the seed carrier, to reproduce mankind and Eve, the egg embryo carrier, the one with the womb through whose body the seed fertilizes and germinates to a living soul, child, or mankind. The curse was carried through blood to the next ratio or ration of man to be born. Hence, gene ration. All right, let's move forward. And let me repeat that once more, just in case it never got home. Once the curse was placed on Adam who bore the seed, that sperm, and Eve who has the egg, that embryo, and they came together, blood transfusion happened. And that child, that man that is going to be born with a woman or a man, now has that bloodline that is cursed within them. And it is being passed now to the next ratio or ration of people. That is why the word is generation. So when you break it down, the gene is being transferred to the next number of people that are going to be multiplied and given authority and dominion should stand in the position as representatives of God over the systems of the world or the earth. Moving on. The etymology or the origin of the word ration. In 1950, it meant the mental process of reasoning. Later, it became the relation of one number to another. In the 1960s, they then uh, changed it to fixed allowance of food. That is why we will say ration, right? Or other means of subsistence for a fixed period of time. However, in 1702, often rations from the French ration in this sense not too sure what that means. I don't know why I put that in. Please forgive me. 
Moving on, all are from Latin rationing, right? That means reckoning, numbering, calculation, business affair, procedure. And I absolutely love this. Reason, reasoning, judgment, understanding. You know why? When the gene now is passed on to the next set of people, the reckoning becomes more corrupted and cursed. The numbering becomes limited. Notice mankind was living much longer at the beginning. As a matter of fact, they were eating from the fruit of the tree of life. So they would have lived forever. But the moment a curse was handed down, man's day became numbered. A day in the, in the sight of the Lord is a thousand years. And so because man was promised that within the day that he ate the fruit, he would have died. Adam and Eve could never live to see a thousand years because that would have been a day in the sight of the Lord. So they died before that day could ever be calculated. Amen. It started to reduce and reduce and reduce. But not only that, curse now starts going into business affairs. It starts to enter now into the procedure of man because their hearts, their reasoning, their thoughts, their judgments and understanding is now becoming desperately wicked. Let's move on. These now are eras in which generational curses affects people. And this started from Adam and Eve eating a forbidden fruit, disobedience. God and mankind. There was no ratio, no numbering, no limitation, no, no, no form of a uh, limit where man was concerned with his relationship with God. God, all things were given into the hands of man. God created, and in Genesis 1, 28, he specifically said, the fowls of the ear and other things on the earth. He spoke about uh, the things in the sea, and he spoke about all the things that are on earth, like the trees and all of that, and the herbs that he gave for the nourishing of man. So all things was given into the hands of man because it was made for man after all. Man sought God to commune with during the day and God would meet with man. God never limited the time in which he would come with mankind. God would also seek out man because he would bring to man and gave him free course to give a title, a name, and description to the things that he had created. My God. And I absolutely love reading these things. And I think I want to read them before I move on. Just for those of you that don't know the things that the Lord has given unto man. Gen Genesis 1, 28 to 30 says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is a fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you, it shall be for me. Notice this. Everything must have something that is complementary to it. For the seed have within itself an egg and an embryo, and it germinates underground, just like the seed germinates within the body of a woman, out of sight. And when the, the time comes for it to shoot forward, then it begins to bud and it begins to multiply. So everything follows a due order. You can't change nothing. And so I know that it is a, a, a demonic agenda in this time and season. And listen to me well when I say this, people of the living God. The moment Satan visited Eve and Adam in chapter 3, LGBT, LGBTQIA plus 2 or whatever they want to call themselves, was on this devil's mind because he saw that together, the agreement that was between Adam and Eve, Lord Jesus, remember what God did. God said, the two is now one flesh. How is that even possible? And it is a mystery that concerns the church and Christ, one flesh. 
The Lord continues to talk about an agreement that the two cannot walk unless they be agreed. And when they come into that agreement, Lord Jesus, there's a there's something that, that comes out of it. Look at the agreement between a husband and a wife. When a husband and a wife comes in agreement, when they have that skinship and they get to that place of release, there is something that comes out of it. There is a birthing. There is always a seed. There is always something physical that is birthed out of that relationship between the man and the woman. And that is what the enemy is trying to kill. But he will never be able to kill it. So let's move on. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the ear and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat and it was so. God did that for man. 3.8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Man didn't find the light in the presence of the Lord God Almighty anymore because he had sin. And sin brings with it shame, guilt, and stain. Mighty God. So all this beautifulness that was happening with them and God. When they came in, Lord Jesus, the Adams before God, they are now hiding from God. The same God that makes them, the same God that they know is omnipotent and omniscient, they are trying to hide from. The next thing that happens between God and man's relationship is that, you know, the things that, that God had given to man and said to name it, like the animals and the beasts and anything that Adam named it, that's what it was, you know, and the instituting what a husband and wife should do in marriage. Adam never had no mother and father. So what was he talking about for this cause? Shall a man leave mother and father and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Adam was setting up something for his sons and daughters to come. It was a pattern for mankind to follow. Because man should always understand that you are in your parents' home for a limited amount of time. And that agreement with your parents now is going to move between you and your wife and, the, and vice versa. Because there's something that happens when you come into that home and you're in agreement. Lord Jesus, there's structure and there's a, a, a set of systems that you are given responsibility for. So you're not always going to be a babe drinking milk, but there's coming a time when you're going to eat strong meat because you now need to go out and establish some multiplication kind of a thing, a replenishing, a rep um, reproducing, a continuity of the system and the program of God. Man was no longer obedient unto God. So he started out in obedience in chapter two. Everything that the Lord did, he um, brought to him and told him to do, he did. But he was no longer obedient by chapter three. There was no prohibitions to God's presence as we read because God came down in the very cool of the day. Lord God Almighty, and we know that God is a consuming fire. So they would have been warm because it's a perfect temperature that they're in. And mighty God. But in the very cool of the day, God brings a little bit of warmth to man with his presence. God gave man of his glory freely because God made creative things and placed it in mankind's hand to have dominion over it. Who is man? We don't, some of the things we don't even understand to take care of the way that we are to, but yet he trusts us because of the breath that he has placed within us and has given us that glory. So that when people look at us, they will praise him. But we also share in the praise. Mighty God. For Adam and Eve, they were known as kings and queens. Abraham, prince. Jacob, prince. Joseph, prince. Daniel, president. Just look at God. These are the operation of God. He does the work. And yet he allows you to be a part of the glory. And this is the thing that man missed up. The next thing is that in chapter 3, verse 1, the woman gives ear to the serpent. No, when she gave ear to the serpent, what that did was to open a gate to her desires. And that gate was open to her ears and her eyes. That's connected because that's a frontal lobe and a temporal lobe. 
that gets into our heart and our thoughts and it influences our behavior. She then introduces it to the man. And remember, both must be complementary and come together to produce the gene needed to create the DNA that then replicates. So if they are both corrupted with disobedience, Lord Jesus, it's a corrupted DNA that is being handed down to mankind. So this is where generational curses are coming from, from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse uh, 4, I think. Verse 6. So now in verse three to four, the woman gives the serpent the info with which to manipulate her mind. Because notice when he came to her, what he said, did God, yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Didn't know which tree specifically, you know. The devil cannot understand some things in the presence of the Lord. There are some things that is hid from him. And it is us that gives that information. That is why we are to be protective of the things that the Lord has given unto us. Because here it is now that she confirms and says, yeah, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of, so you tell the location of the tree and you tell what the tree is and you tell what the consequence is. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Don't touch it, don't eat it. Because if you do, you're going to die. And I don't know where she got that part, um, don't touch it, because when we read in chapter two, the only thing we heard was, do not eat of it. But she heard, don't touch it. So we understand now that what is happening, because she gave him this information, the mind of God is no longer operative in her. The two that is one then joins in agreement and the knowledge of God becomes corrupted in them. So from the very first, the, the generational curses are able to spread because of man's ability to retain the knowledge of God. If you're not able to retain God, then your DNA is so corrupted that the flesh gives way and does the things that the Lord God Almighty says that you're not to do. There's no innocence. There's no purity. There's no truth. Verse five to six, the lust of the eyes is introduced. Evil knowledge now becomes operative. The pleasure of the flesh is now enticing the woman. Desire is increased for evil and ungodly wisdom. And, and um, for evil and ungodly wisdom is now being sought after. Let me repeat that again. Desire is increased for evil within evil. And ungodly wisdom is now being sought after because she's now being told that you will be as gods, come on, G-O-D-S, knowing good and evil. They were already like God, G, capital G-O-D, but now they have demoted themselves because of disobedience. Disobedience is introduced. Desire is shared between the husband and wife and defiance spread. So you now begin to find lies, manipulation, deception, and delusion. Because the Lord never told them that the tree was good for food. But they start to see it now as something that is desirable to eat from. The Lord will allow those that have believed a lie to receive a strong delusion until you are ready to receive truth. Now, Genesis 3, 7, Adam and his wife, in their obedience to the serpent, it resulted in them immediately making aprons from evil knowledge, which made it an evil invention as well as an act of shame because they wanted to cover their sin. Husbands and wives should be, should be more conscious of what it is that they are willing to create among, amongst themselves. Because the truth of the matter is in chapter 225, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. But when sin came into the camp, they were ashamed and they wanted to cover themselves. And I put it to you, they weren't just covering themselves from, not from God, but from each other. Finally, 3.9, God searches for man because he is now unrecognizable. It's not because God didn't know the location of man. But when God looked at man, he saw his image and likeness. No, God cannot look on man because sin is in the camp. And if God looks on man like that, 
then he will be destroyed. See, the word subtle is the same word that signifies naked, right? That same nakedness represents cleverness and mischievousness, which means they became like the serpent. They were no longer bearing God's image and likeness. And this is now the reality of all mankind. Ever up to some cleverer ways, ever up to some mischievous ways. Romans 5, 12 to 14 says this. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. You know, the reason why when Eve ate the, the, the fruit, their eyes were not open because she is the womb. She's the egg and the embryo. That's what she represents. We say Adam represents the seed. Remember, the seed is where the life is and that must come into agreement with the womb. So the moment the man ate, that's when generational curses started. It is important to note, some of us, we don't know how vital we are in our generation. We are a seed. We have the ability to bring forth life in our time. And if we go wayward, Lord God, and I'm speaking spiritually now, taking the physical to speak spiritually. Adam didn't recognize, he thought, he was covering Eve, but he really wasn't covering nothing because he left them more exposed and vulnerable. The enemy really came in and plundered. This is what happened in the relationship between them, marriage. Their intimacy was broken. Notice what Adam did in Gen Genesis 3 and verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living things. In chapter 2 and verse 23, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman. That means he identifies with her. He knows that she is from his body. She knows that he, she, he knows that she is a part of him. But in 3.20, he calls her Eve because she's a mother of all living things. She had not given birth yet. That was prophetic. But what it was, was a detachment from himself to other things. So now the intimacy is broken. 4.25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom came slow. And the reason I added that uh, scripture is because it took from verse 1, 24 verses before we hear about them becoming intimate again, after Cain and Abel had been fully grown. When I read the Torah, um, some of the things that the Pharisees say in rabbinical writings is that there was a rift where Adam was estranged from his wife so they went through a moment of separation and it took grief and sorrow to bring them back again now there is no scripture in the king james version of the bible that tells us that so we cannot owe that to be a biblical truth but it is just interesting to note such a fact the next thing that happened was that there was a barrier in their transparency because they were naked and not ashamed but now they're covering themselves Blame, accusation, mistrust, anger was not present. Genesis 3 and verse 12. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So now, God, are you, are you give me the woman there? And she gave me and me eat it. 
Woman keeps hoping and desiring that the next seed will reconcile her to God and her man, her desire is no longer first to God. 3.16, this is what God says unto the woman. He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. That was a curse because they were both equal in desire to God. And then we see Leah who at first did not conceive, but God saw that she was hated of Jacob and kept on blessing her. And each time she thought that that would turn her husband's affection to her, it did not. The next thing is that the next generation will do in excess that which the parents did in moderation, even though they did not see it. For we see Cain killing Abel, resenting him, hating him, blaming him for what he should have done. We see Lamech taking two wives instead of one. We see Lamech rejoicing and celebrating the fact that he killed um, Cain, right? In 2 Samuel 11, we see David taking another man's wife and plotting his demise. And that conception dying. Adam and Eve's DNA kept replicating. And that is the corrupted DNA I'm talking about. It just kept on replicating in relationships. We see Anna, who, even though her husband was not putting a weight on her, could not bear what the world had to say where her marriage was concerned. Many things happen in marriages that's a generational curse. Your mother or your father may, you know, be the ones who divorced or could not talk peaceably to each other and you identify that as love and you want to bring that over to your relationship, but that's something to reject. Not communicating, not being transparent. God didn't institute it like that. Submission should be two-way. It affected relationship between siblings. Cain hated Abel. This is what 1 John 3, 11 to 12 says. For this is the message that he heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and we know the wicked one is the devil, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Because of that, he could not speak peaceably to Abel, so he drew him into a field that was far away from where his mother and his father was, so he could argue in a vice that he wanted to talk to him. Cain sought an argument with Abel for things unnecessary because he was a farmer. Cain was a, a, a shepherd. Abel was a shepherd, sorry. Cain did not see himself as his brother's keeper or protector. He even asked God that he said, am I my brother's keeper? Yet he was older. Cain refused to change, thinking that it should be Abel who is changing and not him. Now, when the Lord asked Adam, where are you? He didn't own up to his, his sins. He said, the woman will you give me? She gave me the fruit and I ate it after the Lord asked him, if you know that you're naked, did you eat of the fruit that you were not supposed to eat of? And instead of saying, yes, Lord, I did. And I am sorry. He said, the woman give it. And in all reality, the woman did give him. But look at it. He knew what it was. So he was not blinded. And so we see these things being passed down in siblings' relationship. We see throughout generations, even Joseph's brothers plotted out to kill him, Lord God Almighty. They didn't want to get rid of the young man, you know, they wanted to kill him. Could you hate your little brother who could be your child so much that you want to kill him? 
the dreamer, they call him. Here, here is he. He's coming down the road. Look at him, I come, the dreamer. Don't even have no use, just puny, puny. I didn't do bring news to daddy. We see it with Jephthah, son of the strange woman. They're not thinking that his DNA is their DNA. They're thinking about their mother's position and taking on a fight that did not include them coming up against their sibling. And Jephthah, they had to return to, to become captain of the army. David, who shared one father, one mother with his siblings, was seen as a proud, arrogant one and a jacket. Because when you read uh, certain things, certain writings on the life of David, his mother was in a state of divorcement for, from his father. And she actually tricked him into sleeping with her so he, he would not be able to marry her servant. And so all these things, they are generational curses. They have been happening from the beginning. The moment man sin. There's a curse that goes between familial relationship of parents and children. Adam in chapter four of Genesis actively is not actively recorded teaching his sons anything concerning God. Nowhere in there in chapter four. Do you see him teaching them about the things that he heard and saw of God? I believe that he taught them how to sacrifice because they would not have known unless they had been taught. But there is no recording of him imparting anything with them until we get to where Seth is born and we hear that man begins to call on God again. So it must be that some knowledge is passed on. Generation curses affects familial relationships through blood tie and name. Because Genesis chapter 5 begins to tell us this in verse 1 to 3. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, that's Adam. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. So God made a replication of multiple men and women and called them Adam. So they were adopted sons and daughters to Adam. And then in verse 3 and chapter 4, we see that Cain and Abel and Seth are the biological children of Adam. So generational curse then affects familial relationships through blood tie and name. And when it is a name or a blood tie, it is a covenant. Most time when you take on a name, you have to come into a covenant. Covenant. An adoption requires you to sign paperwork. Marriage requires you to sign paperwork, right? If you claim ownership of something through Purchasing it, bartering it, trading it, it requires you to have a bill of sales, right? So if you are tied by name, it's a covenant. If you're tied by blood, it's still a bloodline covenant. So generational curses then are covenants. Let's look at Adam. Adam became a generational curse. So Cain, ultimately Abel, he became a curse to Lamech, who slew Cain, ended up dying himself. He became a curse because he now has genes within him that writes death at a particular age, and it is passed on unto his son. So the knowledge of good and evil is passed on through the genes. Death is passed on through the genes. Old age is passed on through the genes. Sickness is passed on to the genes. Disabilities are passed on through the genes because they are now being corrupted. Let's look at Akon. Akon delivered a curse to his family through bloodline and through name. Because his wife, children, animal, everything that was tied to him died. They were stoned because he did abominable. He disobeyed. He took a Babylonian garment that he was not supposed to take. Let's look at Gehazi. He ran after Naaman and took a gift 
that the prophet Elisha had rejected because he thought he knew better. And his wife and all of his children were smitten with leprosy. So now his DNA is writing leprosy. Now his name is carrying leprosy. David and Achan's name now carries the word troubler behind it. So the generational curse is now trouble. Adam is unto all mankind now, but Achan is trouble. Gehazi is leprosy. David, Lord Jesus conspiracies we see where his son even tried to conspire against him because he took uriah's one wife god allowed his son to sleep with 10 of his concubines and a hill for everyone to see he conspired with others and sent messengers to kill uriah the lord god almighty allowed absalom to see to have secret counsel with people that he would have counsel with and turn their mind from him so we understand that now generational curses is a covenant. It can be a bloodline tie or it can be a name tie. But whatever it is, it keeps on flowing from one to the next. And it gets worse each time for what the fathers are doing moderately, the children are doing expressly. It then affects society. Man is cast out of the Garden of Eden. That was the special society that was made for Adam and Eve. Man now becomes a murderer, so he's a menace to society. Man is going further away from God and building cities and home. So the relationship is severed from God. Man is marrying outside of God's will. Mighty God, you're not seeking God anymore, understanding that when you have a, a wife or you have a woman, it, it's a good thing. And that good thing, the word translated good there means you're in God's desire or God's will. So you're going against God's desire, you're going against God's will, and you're doing your own will. Adam never chose his own wife. God brought his wife to him. Man starts to have corrupted DNA through ungodly covenants that produced giants. Understand this. That when Matt, the son of man, was going into the, the daughter, son of God was going into the daughters of man, it was talking about angels that had fell and found some sort of body to operate through. So now you're finding that that DNA is just so very corrupted and it's producing something that is not like God. God never intended it like that. The scriptures before that, that mentioned son of God are right throughout the Bible always speaks to angels so it doesn't matter how people want to spew it the nephilims were beginning to produce that way because of an unholy and an ungodly union angels were never made to marry because they were made of a higher body and being than humans but we understand that a third of them were passed down and i don't even want to go into that because it's a whole another teaching but it is a reality. Man's heart and thoughts and imaginations were continually wicked before God. And so we have a wicked society that is always trying to scheme, to plot, to plan, to think of how they can do wickedness rather than goodness. It is affecting the society. It affects the environment. The ground was now hard and required force and labor from man to receive its fruits. It was never like that before. A mist would come out of the earth and water the garden. No man is thrown out of the garden and the ground is going to bring thorns and thistles, which mean that while you're doing the work, you're going to be pricked and you're going to be experiencing pains. That was never it before man experienced joy with tending, dressing and keeping the ground, tilling the ground. No, it's going to be in labor and force. The ground would now thirst for blood because when it received the blood of Abel, the blood began to talk to God, but it, it created an appetite within the earth that it had never tasted before. The earth knew sin through man who was taken from it. That is why it says in Romans 8 and verse 22 to 23. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. 
and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Because when our body goes through redemption, the Bible in Revelation speaks of a new earth. It's also going to be redeemed, glorified. So the earth now knows sin through man. Remember when we started, we had man, Adam and Eve as the orange pin and the systems falling behind. Now the earth is a part of that. Man's evil caused destruction to the resources of earth because God swore that he would destroy the earth. It affects the systems around man. Remember, God created the world and everything within. Everything at an order, season, and time, and followed the principles of God. But man had dominion over it, which meant that man would now begin to manipulate the order, the season, the time, and the principles of God within the systems of the world. And we are seeing that today. When man was cursed, he began to limit, to corrupt, to bind and use evil imaginations to develop the earth that only resulted in confusion of tongues, separation of communities, family, idolatry, and pride, to name a few. The gene curse that began to put a ration on man affected every covenant of man through God to preserve and has made a covenant to destroy. So now the covenant that man had to, to replenish the earth and to keep the earth to, to, to preserve it was now turned into a covenant to destroy it because he has now come into covenant with the serpent, the devil. That is why man can lay in wait for other man. That is why man can kill man. That is why uh, a man can sleep with another man's wife and they will plan and you know set up their dates and stuff like that. Because man has now gone into a covenant of destruction. Man is a tripart being, body, soul, and spirit. When we accept salvation through repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, our spirit and soul that was rationed and went further away from God was alienated and suffered death and ultimately would inherit hell, became Regene, with there being no more ration on our communication, relationship, and intimacy with God. Therefore, our name is changed and we are now called the church or the bride of Christ. Yet, there remains a gene rational problem because our, our body, remember, we are a tripart. The soul and the spirit is regene, but what about the body? Now, how does it affect the church since as it affects all the other relationships? Our DNA that was corrupted and started to have anomalies and disabilities that needed to be now um, corrected. It had what was called sin. Sin became a habit. So we see where David is saying, in sin was I shapened and in iniquity, right? So it became, becomes now an habit. From you were young, you start, nobody teaches a child how to lie. If a child takes something and they have it behind them and you're asking them, they're, going, they're saying no, and you're looking at the thing behind them. But what they develop now is a way how to cover it, just like Adam and Eve sought how to make aprons to cover what they had done, what they thought was, was visible to the naked eye. Lost is now conceived, that's also a corruption and anomaly and a disability in man's DNA and still has the ability to overtake us. James 1 and verse 15 says this. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. So these are the things that's in our DNA and it's corrupting us. James 5 continues to say, from whence comes warrens. Four, sorry. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not ends of your loss, that war in your members? Again, the members is your body. You lost and have not, you kill 
and desire to have and cannot obtain. We see Cain doing that to Abel. Instead of changing, he killed him and he still couldn't obtain the honor that God had bestowed upon Abel. The brothers of Joseph sold him and yet they could not attain to the love that Jacob had for Joseph because he mourned him even more than he loved him, loved on him. In our flesh then dwells no good thing. Romans 7, 15 to 24 tells that expressly. So we understand now that this affects the church because we have some persons that are regened spiritually and are within their souls. But the body, within the body lies the ability to sin. Within the body lies the lust that can conceive into sin. And in our flesh dwells no good thing. The church of Corinth was filled with activity of generational curses. To the point where a man slept with his father's wife and actively was in their midst without rebuke and action taken to rectify the situation. God had already given a blueprint as to how to deal with such situations, but they were not followed. These activities are spots in feasts that causes a worship and sacrifices to become tainted and a bad smell before God. See, the teachings of the tabernacle, Elder Collins would have taught us about the, the golden altar of incense and the five fragrant spices that were on it and oh, when it went up into the nostrils of the Lord, how pleasing it was. But when we're gathered together and these incenses comes up before God, what smell are we putting in the nostril of God? Fornication, adultery, murder, lie. The church cannot have power demonstrated and actively add to it daily with such activities in the midst, whether it is immediately obvious or not. You cannot cover it because God is all-knowing. So just like God had to make proper covering for Adam and Eve, so now God has made proper covering for us. Generational curses starts from disobedience and expands by inviting other spirits along that profanes and defiles. So now we are, we are recognizing that there's a multiplication of spirits operating. The initial act is not always visible, but its end result is tangible and visible to the naked eye and before heaven and earth. This is what Ezekiel 18.2 says, the fathers have eaten the sore grapes and set the teeth of the children on edge. Additionally, a general, generational curse is a covenant or blood tied to destruction, bad habits, and ill fortunes over ages and genes. That is why you will accumulate sicknesses, you will accumulate curses, you will accumulate all these different things. If therefore it therefore takes another covenant with a superior power to break that covenant that has you in a generational curse. Because in the first place, a curse can only be passed on by one that is superior or has the authority. So does it require one that is superior and has the authority to break that covenant? The name, blood, and spirit of God has broken sins all over us. We then must continue into that liberty in order to sever such blood and covenant connections because the name of Jesus is above every other name. The blood of Jesus is above every other blood. Not even angels' blood could save us because angels have to pay for their own sins. He said the blood of bullocks and goats he would not anymore. And the spirit of God, God himself is supreme and sovereign and is above all else. The next thing that we need to do is to be sure to repent of every sin for ourselves, that which our family has committed, known and unknown. Psalm 51 is a perfect indication, and a lot of us like to read it, but pay attention to the things that David was really saying unto God. He understood that deep within him lied a, a, a nature to lie, and he wanted to tell the truth. And so here he is repenting of every form of weakness from the day he was a child until adulthood. Acts 2.38 is also another scripture that we need to pay attention to because it says that the name of Jesus remits, removes sins. So it has the ability to break the covenants. 
First Chronicles 4, 9 to 10, we have Jabez, whose name is a covenant. He's repenting unto God because guess what? His brothers are more honorable than him. And he has a name that is causing suffering to him, lack and poverty. And so as he cries unto God to enlarge him, then the Lord changes his name and gives him this enlargement, breaking that curse that is associated to the name. When we apply the name and the blood of Jesus to our lives through baptism and our lifestyle, it also breaks generational curses. It is not enough just to have the name, but our lifestyles must match. Therefore, you must know your family history to refrain. You must denounce and consciously walk away from such behaviors. You see, if Joshua was just saying, I decree in the name of Jesus, that I'm not going to be like the, the Israelites who were born in Egypt. He would have died with those that died along the way. But he actively walked away from their behavior, despised it, and did right before God and man. And so Joshua was one who defied his generation and became the next leader of Israel. Joshua experienced some things that his generation had not experienced and all had died with the exception of Caleb. So understand this, just saying I denounce, just saying I decree, just saying, you know, I reject is not enough. Your behavior must match whatever declaration is coming out of your mouth in order for you to break those generational curses. One of the things that I discovered along my generation when I was growing up was pregnancy in both sides of my family. I recognized it early and I said that would never be me and that would never be my sister. What I started to do was to let my lifestyle match up to what I was saying. And I didn't even know it at the time that that was what I was doing, but I decided that I would not be numbered among them. And so I lived differently from them. I hated to see my grandmother puffing cigarettes and cursing and acting like a tyrant. So, and I believed in, in, in having, you know, a different behavior. So I acted different. I didn't just hate what they were doing, but I acted as well. So I want to say to you today that it is important for you to hear and to do. In the Jew, in the, the Bible that we have, the word that says hear, when you Translated to Hebrew, it means to give observance, to, to take heed to. So when you hear the word, you must do what the word say. And that is why Jesus keeps on stressing about being doers of the word and not only hearers of the word. Because these things, when applied, breaks generational curses. It is important for us to walk uprightly according to God's principles, not our principle. There are some motivational speakers that will tell you some good things, but if you measure them against God's words, it goes against God's words. So I want to say to you today, do not have itching ears. Check the word of God. Walk according to the principles of God's words, endeavoring to have a transformed mind. When I was doing the Jezebel system, I recognized that what Ella came in and did was to transform man's mind. Had man seen things differently from what God said that it was. And so in order to bring back man into connection with him, God had to come and reteach man, Lord God Almighty. And that is why he would attack the very ears that the Jezebel system was very strong in. The Babylonians, when they took the Jezebel system and expanded on it. it. What did they do? Take the most skilled, the most knowledge, um, the, the most um, able, the youngest, the noble, and the royal blood. And they began to teach them their way. The intent was to get them at a place where they would operate like Babylon. If you feed people with enough information, after a while, they're going to start acting out their thoughts because your heart and your thought is connected. Your thoughts and your emotion govern your actions. So if you don't have a transformed mind, a renewed mind, then you're going to act in the old way, the Adamic way. But when your mind is transformed according to uh, Romans 12 and all the teachings of Jesus, then you're going to walk like Jesus walked. Understand this, that a 
a Christian who has been baptized in the name of Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost, repented of their sins. And daily they are not endeavoring to walk after God's word. They are not of a renewed mind. They are not of a transformed mind. And they remain a babe. They're in a state of disability. Because you ought to be growing. You ought to be developing. Your bones ought to be getting, be getting stronger as you read more and more, which means that your will is now decreasing and the will of God is increasing within you. The word of God is finding space to germinate within you and your actions are being transformed. This is where now you become converted and can save another. Remember what Jesus said to Peter, when thou art converted, save the brethren. It was because initially Peter's weapon was his sword. But over time when Peter really stayed and had that transformed man, his weapon was the word, the spirit of God. Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. David, after many recommendations to kill Saul, he said, I cannot do this because he is the anointed of God. David did not follow Saul's way to not have the, the Ark of the Covenant in the camp. He wanted to be able to consult with God. Galatians 5 speaks about the ways of the world and the, the things of the flesh. That is taking counsel from the ungodly. That is why David said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners. Let's go there because I'm not even sure if I'm, yes, in the counsel of the ungodly and standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And one thing that I recognize with David is that his, his writings, they all have a threefold aspect to it, pres past, present, and future. So when he writes, there's something historical about it that means that he's going back and he's making reference to things in the past and learning from it and applying it to his present and speaking prophetically into the future. So when he's speaking about that blessed man that does not walk in the council of the ungodly, he could have very well been speaking about Joseph. He could have very well been speaking about the brothers thereof. Because they all took counsel to kill Joseph. And their, their end was not pretty. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So again, I believe that he's drawing from the experiences of Israel and the many ways that they who ought to be spiritual exemplifiers of God were not. And had a scornful nature that became their downfall. Do not continue in pet peeves, and this is a big one, and old habits that have their roots in old wise favor. I've heard many people say, as some esteem and not change. God does not call you into being that. That's a generational curse that needs to be broken. Pet peeves don't belong in the, the, the kingdom of God because flesh cannot glory in God. Old habits cannot glory in God's presence. These things will not find any place to stand. They will burn. Pray against altars erected and sacrifices made with your name, DNA, image, possession, or even number, what number you fall in your family. Do you know that there are family members who will go and seek out witchcraft and sacrifice you by saying, um, you know, the next girl that comes in the family, she will be the one that will be offered. I have a testimony of doing somebody's here already. And we were experiencing some very supernatural spiritual things because I felt like something was trying to get into my body, was running at top speed to enter my body, but it could not. It kept on being bounced off. And then my spirit started to really get cross and I started to pray. And the Lord started to bring some revelatory things and I was praying it out. And the girl started crying. And I called her a specific name and that made her bawl all the more. And she started to share with me or her mother's family was in witchcraft and they had sacrificed her mother and they were trying to get image of them, their signatures or parts of their DNA to offer them up as sacrifices. 
And so they could not be on social media. They had to be careful who they were in contact with and stuff like that because they had not put on the name of Jesus. And so after talking to her and letting her understand the protection that's in God, she started coming to church with the desire to be baptized in the name of Jesus and she received the gift of the Holy Ghost. What am I saying? I'm saying to some of us, these things sound like fiction, sound like purity, but they are a reality to other persons. Because there are persons that will take people's DNA. There are persons that take people's pictures and pray to all sorts of demons and devils with the intent to lay a curse upon you because they want to limit you they want to hinder you they want to stop you and it is not I, I want you to understand that it is not just you the person but whatever it is that the lord has invested within you that's what they're coming up against others that would do it free maturely before you were even born they are doing it for self-gain for the dark kingdom that they want to be a part of the next thing is that we need to walk in obedience because light removes and confuses darkness. Ephesians 5, 6 to 18 says it this way, and I want to take my time and read that one because sometimes we jump over it. Let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. You are not light of yourself. You need the Lord to be light. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That is what enables us to be able to shield our lives and our children from generational curses, the fruit of the spirit against that there is no law. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and christ shall give thee light see then that ye walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is and be not drunk with wine. You know what drunken people do? Stumble, stagger, talk foolishness, vomit upon themselves. There is no soundness in their body. They have no balance, no control because it is excess. But be filled with the spirit of God. The spirit of the Lord brings the order of God. The spirit of the Lord brings the presence of God. Start being of a double mind. In concluding, brethren, man's DNA became corrupted or mutated through disobedience. Operative one, right there so it starts and everything else starts to follow. So you see, those of us that are dwelling in disobedience, repent right now and actively start to do the things that the Lord has told you to do or mandated us in his word. This is what a mutation or a corrupted DNA is. It is random changes that occur within the sequence of the basis. These are the basis. These lines here that looks like little flutes or bamboos. They can be large scale, altering the structure of the chromosomes, or a small scale where they only alter a few or even a single base. You understand? So it may be one in the family. It may be all. It may be two. Depends. Lies, charms, subtility led to the altered gene that reproduced and became a large scale problem because, again, Adam represented the entirety of human race, Adam and Eve. So, lies from the enemy, charms from the enemy, subtility and disobedience led to a large scale problem. This is what 
sin did to us. It made us look like the, the, the skeleton over here. But Jesus typifying the second Adam has come to correct our DNA and return us, restore us to sons as well as our behaviors to change them and our thoughts. So now we don't look like dead people anymore, but we now have a form and an image. Jesus came to repair a corrupted DNA. There, when he comes to, to, to um, repair the corrupted DNA, these are the things that must happen. There has to be a removal of the damaged bases followed by resynthesis of the excised region. So you see, if he cuts out a part of here, it have to, it have to go back again. He has to fix it. And that's the only way we are going to take on form. Ligament is going to come to ligament, skin to skin, flesh to flesh, bone to bone, and the blood is going to flow again. The word of God is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Hebrew 4 verse 12, that's why it divides joint and marrow because it, that is what gets down into our system and begins to repair that corrupted DNA. It begins to sever those things that your mama and your, your papa used to tell you. You used to make the X over your bed with the olive oil. You used to stretch out the Bible because you think that putting the word on the bed and not having it in your heart is what's going to be your, your, your protection. You believe the tape measure and the R shoe. You believe going to that mother and getting the bath is what's going to settle it and, and change all the um, curses. No. It is the word of God when it gets in you and it starts to change your attitude and your behavior. Remember when David sinned against God, Absalom was not there. Amnon was not there. Yet Amnon took evil counsel and sinned against his sister. Absalom devised, conspired, and meant to kill him. The things that you do in darkness, the word of God, this two-edged sword comes like light into you and it begins to give truth in the inward part of you and it begins to sever and it begins to make a change. It begins to cut out and to repair and to reset. That is what we need today, the word of God. So it's not so much the things that you are coming out of your mouth with that's making the internal, internal change. When the internal change happens, then whatever you declare out of your mouth, it's going to be. Amen. Understand the order of it. The declarations of failure, of doom, of weakness, disobedience, every lie, slothfulness, that is action, you're not fervent pride and abusive words you have been making over your lives, your children, your family, and others, stop making them. Get the word of God into you. And when the word of God gets into you, start declaring the word of God over yourself and over them. For life and death is in the power of the tongue. The desires and appetites of the world lies on our tongues. It starts there. What delights your taste buds today? Whatever it is, and if it's not of God, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereafter. But rather circumcise your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Plus, the heart is deceitful above all. Remembering, remembering that the heart and thoughts are intertwined. They are one. Your emotions, your will, your cognition. We are the bride of Christ, much like Eve was Adam's. Let us be connected to Jesus, bones of his bones and flesh of his flesh. So we identify with him and will become his, re, his generation that conceives and multiplies the kingdom of God. Amen. And that's a generational curse. Hallelujah. I want to thank you for having me tonight. I want to thank you for listening. And I want to bless God for the change that is going to come out of tonight. You know, just before I go, I want to pray for somebody that is having a struggle. They can see clearly the things that's happening in their family. They can see clearly the things that's happening in their church, in their community, and they want to be that change. But it seems like the will to do that is not there. So I want to pray for you right now. 
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for your sons and your daughters, Lord God, that every generational curse, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, will stop with them, Lord God, as you actively, Lord Jesus, give them that desire to do. Lord God, to will is not enough. They need to do, God. And it is you, Lord Jesus, that works in us to will and to do. Father, even now, I pray that you'll begin to create a desire for the word, create a desire and an appetite for the things of you. Lord Jesus, let them begin to thirst and to hunger after righteousness, God. Right living with brothers and sisters. Rightness before you, Lord God. Father, let a man examine his ways, God, according to your word and not his friend. Lord God, I might not have an itching ears or a form of godliness. Father, tonight, Lord Jesus, Jesus, we pray, Almighty God, blessed Savior, that we will take the time out, Lord Jesus, mighty God, to fast and to pray and to seek after you, Lord Jesus, to pray, Lord God Almighty, that our wills be broken and your will be done in our lives, Lord Jesus, that as of this day, Lord God, we will press towards the mark of the prize of the higher calling in you, Lord God, forgetting those things which are behind, Lord Jesus, purposing in our hearts, Lord God, that we are the generation that declares you. And as for us and our house, we will serve your God Almighty today. Amen. We pray, God, that you'll break generational sicknesses, generational curses, God. Travel through bloodline, Lord God. Travel through names, Lord God. Father, somebody that have not yet put on the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that they will come into it, God, because your name is superior. God Almighty, it's the name of Jesus that removes sin. It is the name of Jesus that cuts into DNA, Lord God, and repairs it, Lord Jesus. So we're to somebody tonight, Lord God Almighty, oh, Lord Jesus, out of sinking and shame, Lord God, and abomination. Let them come into the provision that you have made for salvation, Lord God, turning their hearts to you, Lord God Almighty, and surrendering, Lord Jesus, knowing, Lord God Almighty, that you have better Lord. things for them. Lord God Lord. Almighty, today we pray, Lord God, that we will not just be ears of the word, but we will be doers. Lord God yes. Almighty, help us, Lord Jesus, yes. not to compromise, God, for Father, whatever your word says, that's what it is, Lord Jesus. There is no lies, God. Your word is infallible, Lord God Almighty. It goes from generation to generation, God. So tonight, Lord God, break the yoke of bondage off of your sons and daughters. Grant deliverance today, God. There are some, Lord Jesus, evil intents, God. Wickedness that dwells within our hearts, God. That sometimes will not allow us to see ourselves. Reflect your, you, Lord God Almighty, to us and your goodness, Lord Jesus, through your words. Let us see the errors of our ways, Lord God, and yes, turn to a loving God that is yes, able, Lord Jesus, to change us, to transform us, to renew us, to regene us, Lord God, and recommit us, Lord God, reconnect us. Lord God, let us not be of a keen spirit, Lord Jesus, wicked, Lord God Almighty, Lord Jesus, and become vagabonds, Lord Jesus, but help us to repent, Lord God, Abba Satai, in the name of Jesus, putting each other above ourselves, God, in the name of Jesus. God, no Knowing that if we honor another God, then there is honor unto us. God, we yes. give you glory. We give you yes. honor today, Lord Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, that we will no longer dwell in disobedience, Hallelujah. but we will come to obedience in the Amen. name of Jesus Christ. Jesus glory Christ. be to God. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Glory Praise be to God. God. I hand back Praise over God. to you, Elder Ill, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise what can God. I say? What can I say? What can Hallelujah. I say? I'm just going to say this, people of God. Praise God. As I sat here and I muse on the word, and in my spirit I was asking God, you know, what do I say after? What, what are you saying? I heard what you're saying to us. And the spirit ministered to me, and I said to myself, as soon as I come back on, I'm just going to ask Evangelist Karen to just pray for us. And she just went ahead and did it without me having to ask. And I believe God was just proving to me. Hallelujah. Has ordained what happened here tonight. And let me tell you something, saints of God. Hallelujah. What is going to happen is what we call uh the, the the thought is slipping me just now but it, it is the word is going to be causing 
a struggle in our hearts. We are going to be tempted to fight it. And I want you to understand what is going to take place. We are going to be tempted to fight this word from the realm of our flesh. Anything, any problem that is caused on any level cannot be solved on that same level. Amen. It takes something on a higher level, yes, higher sir. dimension to solve any problem created on any level or on Amen. any dimension. Amen. And what is going to happen tonight is that we are going to be searching in our memory bank through our cognitive processes to try to match up this word to see if there's anything in it that is familiar to us. And if there's nothing familiar, we're going to try to refute it and to fight it. What I'm saying to you, people of God, if you have if you are doing what you have always done, you're going to get a result that you have always gotten. Amen. And if you are in a position right now, it is because of the level of knowledge that you have, why you are where you are now. Some things were said tonight that we maybe have never heard before. And I say to you in the name of Jesus, don't fight it. Talk to God. Ask God for a spirit of clarity. Ask God for understanding and the ability to receive. Because what happened to us is that we, when we hear something, we try to search our thoughts to see if it match up with what we already know. And if we don't know it, we tend to refuse it. So I'm saying to us tonight, saints of God, what? Do, try not to glory in what we already know. Try to find out what you don't know because it is what we don't know that is destroying us. My people are destroyed, are destroyed. for a lack of knowledge because we refuse knowledge. And God has spoken to us tonight in no uncertain terms. In our own minds, we just think that generational curse is, is, is when somebody will be a yoke. But God would allow us tonight to hear the genesis, to hear where it started, where this thing came from. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And it is only truth that can set us free and make us free. Amen. People of God, Something can be true, but it is not the truth. <laughs> Let me say that yes, again. Sir. Something yes. can be true, but it is not the truth. You may be weak, and that is true, but what does the truth say? The Bible said, let the weak say, yeah, I am strong. We speak the things that are not as though they were. So it can be true that you are poor. But his word said, let the poor say, I am, I am rich. So we want to go with the truth tonight. And Jesus Christ is the truth. The word that I was thinking about was cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance takes place when we hear, we, we have something that we believe to be true. And we hold on to them. The Teacher spoke tonight about old wife fables. People saying, I saw me stay, I saw me born, and this a month, I'm a born, me born, and that is a sign. And sometimes we take those things and we believe that this is what I know, and this is a hoigo, and I saw me stay, I'm a plane, I'm a this, I'm a that. And people of God, when we are faced with the truth of God's word and it goes against what we hold to be true. Even if they are all by fables, there's a feeling that comes up in us, that feeling to reject the truth, even when it is tearing us in the face. But because it comes against what we hold to be true, I say to us tonight, let God be true and every man be a liar. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Let us humble ourselves at the mighty hand of God and realize that it is only the truth of the word of God that can really make us free and set us free. Amen. And tonight we have heard the truth of God. We can are just going to ask. Can I just give a testimony? Can I give a testimony just to confirm what you just said? Go ahead. Go ahead. Greetings, brethren. When I just got saved, I was in a Bible study one night. It was a day. I think it was a Easter. It was a Good Friday. And I remember the teacher was teaching and I got up and I made mention of something that I knew according to the word. And uh, the teacher said to me, if that is what you believe, shut up and sit down. How do you, and I, I quoted the scripture and the person said I should keep quiet and sit down. And about 13 years after, the same teacher came back to me and said, sometimes things that we learn when we get older, because we're in the gospel a long time, we don't believe and we will not accept some things from a younger person. And he said, I remember what I said to you about 13 years ago, but I just came back from a pastor's conference. And the very thing you said in that Bible class 13 years ago, I went there and I heard it and I just accepted it. Hmm. It took him 13 years, Bertrand. My Lord. For him to learn the truth of something that a young brother just come into church. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the elders I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. In 13 years to learn what he could have learned that day. What Elder Hill just said. Sometimes we search our memory and all of that to find out if, did I hear this before? Well, I'm going to reject it. Virgin, take it from me. Mm -hmm. What we have heard tonight, think about it, pray about it, because it's truth. God bless you, Elder. My God. So, people of God, God loves us. God loves us. And when the queen of Sheba went to Solomon and heard of his wisdom. Half has never been told. <laughs> my God. She said the half has never been told. And she said, oh, how God loves no. Israel. Oh, my God. That he should give Israel, give you to Israel to be their king. People of God, it is the love of God displayed to us tonight that he should give us this word to bring us out of darkness and to release us from some of these curses that have been inflicted upon us and have been self inflicted. Tonight, I think. We all should unmute our mics and I'm going to be asking everybody just to pray at this time for the teacher tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe she has labored. She has given herself to study the word of God and she has been brought into a place. And let me tell you, saints of God, she has not yet touched some things and she said she wouldn't even touch something. She would leave it for another teaching. When she spoke of the sons of God. Oh my God. Coming into the daughters of men. Sins of God. Sometimes we are boasting in just knowing Acts 2.38. And we think that that's all I need to know. And I'm telling you, Virgin, that is why we are where we are. And we won't experience the fullness of God. Because there are deeper depths and higher heights in God. Jesus said to the scribe and pharisees if you said you were blind you'd have received sight and tonight i want to say i don't know anything and i'm glad for to be schooled tonight in the word of god and i'm just going to ask everybody at this time just, well, open them just before we pray Virgin, just before we pray i've been resisting this thought normally i don't do something like this but i'm not going to let the enemy let me keep quiet I'm going Go ahead. to say, especially for those of us here in the United States. Evangelist Mitchell, I know you never tell me to do anything like this. So I'm going to apologize before I do it. But I am led to do this. 
before you pray, brethren, pray for this also, that if the Lord lay it on your heart, what this Mitchell has been teaching, to send something to give her. You can just write it in the chat, personalize it to her, and ask her how you can get it to her. Please, pray about it. And whatever the Lord place on your heart. She has not asked me to do it. Normally, I don't do something like this. But I have been fighting against asking, and I realize I need to stop it. The Lord, put something on your heart sometimes. You don't to do it. The Lord, lay it on your heart and your tongue to contribute something to her. Please do. There might be individuals here might be wondering, how can I do it? But I'm going to, I'm just, just going to chat, scroll down to her name, and just send a, a little message to her, and let her respond. God bless you all, brethren. Ella here. Praise God. Praise God. Wonderful man of God. Just going to ask everyone to unmute their mics at this time, and we just hold up the woman of God before God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's unmute your mics, everyone. Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. You have used her mightily, God of mighty. You are mighty to serve you. For the grace that you are receiving yesterday. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> God in the let your will be done, God. Salute you, God, by Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, people of God. God bless you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Oh, my God. Thank you for this word, woman of God. Glory to God. You have researched and you, you have done the will of God. And I pray tonight that there be a manifestation. Glory to God. That somebody will be delivered. Glory to God. By the truth of the word of God. To the glory of God. God bless you. Hand over now to Pastor Marx. Glory to God. You can just finish up Pastor Marx and do the greetings. In the name of the Lord. God bless you, saints.
And we we're just gonna close off right there. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Praise God, praise God, hallelujah. God is a good God. We're just gonna be closing off, brethren. And like you heard, it's just a moment of you know introspection and just a moment of just allowing God to have his way. After all, it's all about what God wills and what God requires of us. So as we close off tonight, just giving God thanks for each and every one that is on. Let us utilize this information that God has allowed us to get for the three weeks past uh, from his daughter, favored daughter. And let us just avail ourselves that God will just do what he wants to do. Let us walk in the way that he requires and that these curses that the enemy wants to continue to, 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 to revel in over us be broken because we claim it now we walk in it and we believe it yes. because we are in amen. jesus christ amen god bless you god bless you god bless could you I, could i say something before you leave the elder man yes go ahead that's missionary yes. Delia. yes um when i heard us you know talking and really giving those words and you know i remember being at church and we had a teaching pertaining to generational curse. And I remember I did, while I was there, I began to look back in my life and realize how many generational curse was following in my family. And I remember I went up to the altar and I threw some, and there was nothing there for me to put the oil in. And there was this plastic bag and I tore the plastic bag and I threw some oil in it. And I went home and I took my children and I began to curse some generational curse. I mean, I have family who got pregnant pretty young, who had children for so many different men and stuff. There was so much and I began to curse it. Um, you have um, molestation, stuff like that. There was so much that I began to curse those. And I must say that I sit here and when I heard her saying it, I began to give God thanks because I realized that he had broken so many generational curse in my children's life. He had, he, I mean, that night going home and praying, when, when I heard her say it, I said, thank you, Jesus, because those curse did not follow my children. And tonight, when I heard her say it, it was a confirmation. I mean, my heart filled with joy, just hearing her speaking tonight. You know, and I hope other will hear and move because I didn't just pray, but I began to live my life for them to understand, for my children to understand. I began to speak some things. I mean, I have children who I took into my home and I began to speak life upon their life and, and pray and break some generational curse in their life. And I've seen where God had worked. So I'm giving God thanks for these words tonight. And I'm really hoping and praying that others will hear and move and live. Not only, as she said, not only just cursing it, but walking in it. God bless. Glory to God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Indeed, brethren, you know, it's a, it's a serious time. And God has a purpose in everything. And God's purpose is being manifested uh, more and more as we seek him, as we get closer to him, all we've got to do is to take his word, walk in his word, and we will see. And as Ella Hill and Ella Sharp was just saying a while ago, it's not time to resist. It's no. time to just walk in the word of Almighty God and humble ourselves before God and let God's will be done. This world is crying out right now for the sons of God to arise 
and to, to, to accomplish his purpose and that his will be done in just say in your location, wherever it is, Flagaman, St. Elizabeth, wherever it might be, mm -hmm. Connecticut, New York, Montego Bay, uh, Spanish Town, wherever it mm -hmm. might be, Manchester, anywhere, thy will be done in this location, in my life yeah. as it's been done in heaven. That's what we are seeking. God bless you, brethren. Be of good courage. I don't know if Elder Sharp has an announcement for next week. God bless you. It was just a, a privilege to be here. And God is working. And God's will is being accomplished. In the name of Jesus, God bless you. All right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise uh, the Lord. Praise the Lord, uh, Bridget. Before uh, we continue, I'd just like to say uh, we just want to breathe a special word of prayer at this time for Elder Chris Collins. Uh, he was not well, you know, tonight, and uh, maybe he's still listening, but he, he had to retire to, to lay down because his body wasn't well. And I just want to just, let us pray for him. In the name of Jesus. Two minutes. Father, in the name of Jesus Hallelujah. Christ, thank you for your servant. We thank you that you are a great God. Hallelujah. We are, are still a we agree on this matter, God. God. Almighty. Your son, you know. Heal. Hallelujah. Lord God, Lord, Lord, God, Lord, right now. Right now. Lord God, right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Hallelujah. God, 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 In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Have been on there, my God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Yes, um, you know, I sit here. With, sometimes we're making plans and the Lord is changing things. You know, he's changing things around. And I don't know what is going to happen next week. There is a person plan, but for some reason, I don't know. Man, Liz Mitchell, you might be back on next week again, so prepare yourself just in case the Lord change things around again. I am learning. I am honestly learning to lean and depend on Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. But sometimes we make plans in a church, man. The Lord just shut it down, cause some people to be sick hmm. because it's not their time. Prepare yourself, Man, Liz Mitchell, that if the person gets sick again, <laughs> I'm just telling you, you know, I'm just telling you, I sit here and I don't know, I will not be surprised if the Lord says you coming up again next week. So God bless you all, brethren. Thanks for joining us. I'm just giving you the heads up, Evangelist. Be prepared. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Lord do his thing. Not, not Ben Russia. Glory to God. Glory to God. Not me. You know, because for me alone, I want to organize everything. I want to organize. It. I'm learning to shut up and look. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in peace tonight, brethren. In Jesus' name. Thanks for joining. See you next week at 7.30. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Bless you, Elder Marx. Bless God, you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. I sent you a direct message there too. So. Yes, I saw it, sir. I responded. Thank you. You respond? Oh, yeah. Yes. I will talk to you. Yes, sir. We will talk. <laughs> blessings. Bless you, Sister Nadine. Bless you, Brother Akeem. Bless you, Sister Faith and Sister Keisha. God bless you. So Mary, God bless you, my dear. I see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Minister Sharp. God bless you, everyone. God bless you, teacher.
God Great bless job. you. God bless you, Sister Valerie. I was just about to unmute. I said I can't pass, Sister Valerie. I ah. thank you for your support. I thank you. Bless you, my sister. Great job. Thank continue you. to do his work. Yes, please continue to pray me through. Will do, my dear. Will do. Good night, everyone. I'm going to be logging off. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Thank you.